We're now ready to move into the clinical development process itself. We've done all our planning, we have done all our preclinical testing, and we can start moving forward to the exciting point of putting our new compound into human beings for the very first time. Classically, we talk about three phases in the clinical development process up to the time we submit a product for uh, authorization to put it onto the market. Phase one is what we call clinical pharmacology. Phase two is early proof of clinical efficacy. Phase three is confirming that clinical efficacy and also building a big safety database to give us confidence about going forward onto the market. And then we also need to consider what sort of special populations we're going to look at. I mentioned already the elderly and the children. Let's look at phase one, what we classically call clinical pharmacology studies. And the very first study is called first into man or first into humans. We say man quite deliberately because it's almost always the case that the very first people who get exposed to a new compound will be young men, somewhere between the ages of perhaps 18 and 40, maybe 50 at maximum. And these will be non-patient volunteers. We no longer use the word normal. So for instance, if somebody's got an ingrowing toenail, perhaps they're not uh, in the end of the day completely normal but they don't have anything that would in any way interfere with, the, uh, with them participating in one of these clinical studies. We start off by just giving a single dose and see what happens and then we increase the dose and then we increase the dose further to a point where people are beginning to say hey listen I'm getting some sort of side effects with this I can't tolerate taking this anymore. And then we move on to repeat doses. In other words, we give the same person uh, the, the product uh, for seven days or perhaps 14 days, maybe even 28 days, to see what happens when they're repeatedly exposed to it. And the chances are that the maximum dose you'll reach in those studies will be lower than in the single dose studies. We will collect that key pharmacokinetic data and we're going to look at that in some more detail in just a moment. And we're also very keen to collect what we call safety and tolerability data. And this will include not just the clinical symptoms that the person uh, can tell you about, but we're probably uh, looking at the electrocardiogram. Uh, we'll be certainly looking at clinical uh, laboratory measures of various uh, uh, samples of blood going off to labs to look at blood sugar, liver function, kidney function, etc. And we will also try now to measure something which says yes this product does what you you intended it to do what we call pharmacodynamic markers Ph pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body so if you take uh, something for blood pressure the pharmacodynamic outcome is a lowering of the blood pressure and usually the phase one helps us define the dose, the starting dose at least, for going into our phase two studies. So what's, just to, just to remind ourselves, what is pharmacokinetic data? Well, it's absorption. Uh, the drug is given by mouth and it gets absorbed either from the stomach or the duodenum. Um, so that's absorption. It gets distributed. Where does it go to? It might go to the brain, it might go to the kidney, it might go to the lung, it might go to the joints, it might go to the muscle. It gets distributed. It then gets metabolised always, not always, but almost always, in the liver. It gets transformed by a number of enzymes in the liver that we call the P450 uh, series of enzymes, which will convert drugs and usually make them um, more easily excreted from the body. So then we can also look at elimination to see how the drug gets out of the body, whether it gets out in the urine or in the faeces or whatever. Then we do a radio-labeled study called a mass balance, which tells us what happens to every molecule that you give and, and where it goes in the body and, and how it gets transformed and excreted. And then we also now want to see whether everybody behaves the same or whether there are some people that handle drugs quite differently. 
if you take codeine for treating pain, 10% of the population will get no benefit whatsoever because codeine is what we call a prodrug for morphine. It is methyl morphine. In order to experience the beneficial effect of relieving pain with codeine, you need to convert it into morphine in the body. And about 10% of the people do not have the enzyme that allows that conversion to take place. So they don't get any pain relief with taking codeine. And there are many examples where a subset of the population handle drugs completely differently. And this can be very important clinically. So here we have a uh, pharmacokinetic curve. Uh, what we're looking at is a drug given by mouth and you'll see on the left hand side of the curve it's climbing steadily up to a, up to a peak and then it declines over a period of time. <clears throat> the time it takes to get to that peak we call the T-max, the time to reach the maximum blood concentration. And that concentration is called the C-max, the maximum concentration ever achieved. And these two can be really important. If you want something that starts uh, to act very quickly, but the T-max is six hours, then it's not going to work. If you want something uh, that's going to work very effectively and, it's, and the plasma dose, the plasma concentration at which it's going to work is, say, um, oh, uh, two milligrams per litre, and you can only get it up to 0.5 milligrams per litre, it's not going to work. So these are two important measurements that we need to look at. And then uh, we look at the decline of that curve as the drug is excreted out of the body um, and we measure what we call the half-life. How long does it take for the plasma concentration, the amount of drug in the blood, to drop by half? And this tells us what is the uh, duration of action of the, of the, of the medicine um, and also gives us a prediction as to whether or not the product is going to accumulate as you take repeat doses. Then we also want to measure that whole area underneath that, those slopes, the upslope and the downslope, and we call that the area under the curve. And that gives us a, a clear picture of the total amount of drug that has been absorbed into the body. And the area under the curve gives you the exposure of the body to the drug. Again, a critical measurement. These four measurements are absolutely crucial to have a good understanding of them before we go forward into our further development plans.